You're watching All To Play For, brought to you by Joe and Coral. Hello and welcome to All To Play For, brought to you by Joe and Coral with me, Steve Sidibal, and of course, Joe Cole. Joining us today is a former teammate of mine that played over 500 career games at clubs such as Manchester United, West Ham, MK Dons, and finishing at his hometown club, Cambridge United. Um, the question we all want to know, we'll get down to it, is did he get the hairdryer treatment from Sir Alex? But first of all, let's welcome Luke Chadwick. Chadwick, welcome, mate. Thanks, Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming Great down for the show. Both. Teammate of mine as well, under 21s. Chad, he was the man. Yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. Give ball Chaddy, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Howard Wilson give, loved Chaddy. Give ball to Chaddy. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting in the 21 squad because Howard Wilson was the 18s yeah, manager, yeah, weren't yeah. he? No, no one had a clue who I was. I was still <laughs> playing in the under-19s at Man United, got in the under-21 squad. He was probably the manager that rated me the highest, I reckon, out of any <laughs> manager I ever played for. But do you know what? He, like, as much as Howard got a, a rough rap for being a bit old school, he was the first manager I played at who played the tried to play the four three three, and like you know, but he put me in the in the, in the central midfield with other bodies and was like he was, he was trying to be a bit clever. You know, yeah. he gets a lot of stick for being a bit one dimensional, but I thought he was quite ahead of his time. And then Jose obviously come along five six. Everyone was yeah. playing four four two yeah. back then, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, of course, yeah. And he come up, so I, I didn't mind Howard. Strange, well, strange geezer, but well, okay. So we said in the intro the local hometown club Cambridge United. How has Luke, had, Luke Chadwick from Cambridge United ended up at Manchester United. Yeah, so I started off sort of just playing locally. I mean, I remember playing against you. You probably don't remember. You were playing for Arsenal at the time. Right. We were playing for a team called East Anglia Boys. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sort of, yeah, Arsenal played against them. That was a, friendly, yeah, that was a yeah. common friendly yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, we used to play that all the time. You was unbelievable, by the way. Rainbow <laughs> shot. Every time you got the ball. You were right, Sid. He's only nine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were 14. <laughs> But then sort of played, yeah, played, I went to Arsenal, played there for a season in the centre of excellence, sort of training at Highbury, the old yeah, indoor gym the there. JC, yeah. yeah. And then played schools football for Cambridge School, scoring a lot of goals, got scouted to go to Man United, went up there for sort of a trial for a week and just sort of fell in love with the place. The second I went up there, it was just the environment you yeah. went in. It was just, don't get me wrong, Arsenal was a great football club, but United just felt different, it felt sort of right where I wanted to be. Yeah. So that's when I, I signed it. Up. Sorry, Chad, was it a fella called Malcolm Fidgeon who took you up there, <clears throat> the South East scout? Yeah, so the guy that scouted me was called Ray Med right, Medwell, okay. like great guy, but Malcolm yeah. was up there, he used yeah, to be yeah, up yeah. in the hotel and that, he had a, yeah. like a fantastic yeah. reputation as a scout. He used yeah. to do the London area, Ray used to do sort of the East Anglia right. where I was. But yeah, I went up there and just done okay, signed a schoolboy form and then spent the next couple of years living back in Cambridge, going up there yeah. on the weekend. And then when I left school at 16, signing a YTS and moving up there yeah. full time. So how old was you when you signed for, for Man U? So I'd been 14, 14. signed school. So I've no doubt that Sir Alex Ferguson was still involved in that sort of procedure oh. in terms of spotting the talent that you were. Yeah, that, that's a, like the what sort of draws you in. He's involved mm. in everything. Yeah. From the moment you go up there as a trialist, I remember I went up there for a week, sort of trained with the, my age group team with the scholars and then finished with a game against Nottingham Forest at Littleton Road and Sir Alex was there. He come in the dressing room and you're thinking, wow, this is mad. Like, yeah. Sir Alex is there. Yeah. And then I got the, the minibus, dropped me back at Manchester Piccadilly, got a five hour train ride home back to the yeah. little village where I live. Mum's picks me up from the from the station, getting a car. She said, Oh, Alex Ferguson phoned me up this afternoon asking if you'd sign no on way. She's like she's mucking about it. But she, he actually done that. But it but it weren't just me yeah. that he'd do that for. It'd be all yeah. the young ones. Yeah. But he'd done it, he done it with me as well. Yeah. Same thing. Like and he's so powerful, ain't it? Oh, like, so powerful. It's why he's like it was why he's the best. Yeah. Like he's he was go you have to remember at the time, the mid nineties he was been going for trying to win the first title for United. I think they won it in '93 for 20 years, re-establishing the club, and he's still got time to go and watch the under 14s and 15s. Like, where did the man find the energy? It, I, I had the same thing. He rung my my my, my house, and my mum answered, and she's just gone like, "Yeah, fuck off." You know, like, like, thinks it's a wind up. Dad's on the phone. He's like. I think it is, you know. <laughs> Could be some random Scottish geezer from the boozer. You know what I mean? Like, because everyone obviously, but yeah, same thing. But uh, brilliant, brilliant. And yeah. he, we used to go up there again. I used to play from, I played them a couple of times. Lovely weekends in Manchester. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, it just wasn't right for me. Why didn't why 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 didn't you sign for him? Simple reason. Um, I loved I loved West Ham. I loved my teammates at West Ham. Uh, like you would know, we was a good team. Yeah, like oh, you yeah. was a great youth no. team. We was a really great yeah. team. And and so it got down to the fact. And I I tell you what, it comes down down to ninety four or five. Well, um, FA Cup final. Ferguson asked me to come with a team, but I'd already made my mind to to go to watch the game with the team. Walk out, sit on behind the bench for the FA Cup final for a 13 year old lad, it would have been amazing. But my, my, my dad said to me, Where do you want to go? Like, because I don't, it was a big gesture. Yeah. I didn't want to take it and not do it. Yeah. And then um, I said, No, I said, Dad, I'm happy at West Ham. All right, that's it, done. But you can't do the FA Cup. I thought, Can I? He <laughs> went, No, 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 we, we, you don't take things off people if you, you know what I mean? So life lessons from my dad. And, I, yeah. and then he had to ring up. I think it was Malcolm or Alex Ferguson, and say, look, thank you for, but he's, he's chosen to sign for West Ham. Yeah. Simple, Respect. just brilliant. Uh, yeah, I think Sir Alex didn't have my mum and dad's number. He didn't call me. Yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, listen. So you're at United. Talk about now. Like, out, so you're in the first team. You know, you're training. What is it like? Because that dressing room there alone, that, that, like you got the Sir Alex that we just spoke about, but you've got super, like heroes in there. I mean, yeah. the names, the, the Beckham skulls. Uh, was, was Eric there? Was Kansas? He, he'd just left when I moved up there yeah. as a as a scholar. He yeah. sort of finished mm. the season before, so never got to sort of play or train with him. Yeah. But like obviously, going up there, huge excitement, going to do something you love yeah. every day for one of the biggest clubs in the world. But sort of massive yeah, trepidation yeah. as well. I was such a quiet young lad, young yeah, shy yeah. boy. He was quite really introverted, and it was sort of for. I'm a bit out of place here. And I used to, all the other lads were sort of buzzing. They got to train with the first team. I used to yeah. dread it thinking, oh, I'd rather just, I was more comfortable with my own yeah, peers, my yeah, friends yeah. and that sort of thing. So sort of dread it, train with the first team. Obviously done it a few times, done all right. And then had a really good scholarship, done really well, got offered a contract during my scholarship and probably thought, I've cracked it here, I'm, I've made mm. it here and sort of went away for the summer Went to I'd be for me pals, probably let myself go a little bit, come back for pre-season, like really skinny but with an horrible little pop belly. <laughs> <laughs> weren't, doing, weren't doing the best in a run and had a poor start to my first year as a professional and got sent off on loan to, to Royal Antwerp, went and played out there for like nine months, absolutely loved it. Yeah. And it's when I come back from there, I was sort of the first time I was in and around the first team yeah. on a on a regular basis. And obviously first training session, went back in, was at Antwerp for nine months where I was sort of top boy, sort yeah. of strut around, doing me little bits and pieces. <laughs> went back yeah. in the United, gave the ball away a couple of times. And I remember it like Roy Keane's just gone mad at me, like calling me every name under the sun. Straight I'm away. Thinking, mm. Like straight away. And I'm thinking, flipping hell, not sure. <laughs> Weren't expecting that sort yeah. of thing. And I'm thinking, after the session, he sort of pulled me and said to me, like, I've said that to you and I'll keep saying that to you, but there's a reason behind it, the reason yeah. I'm doing it, because that is the standards here. Yeah. We want to be the best team every day in training. Yeah. That's why we're going to win games on a Saturday and sort of learn yeah. lessons really quickly yeah. that you've got to be on it every yeah. day. And although I didn't play all that much, I was on the bench most of the time, but every day was so intense in training because of the characters there, yeah. because of the standards there. And it yeah. was like an amazing, amazing yeah. experience. Yeah. But at the end of the season, I like, obviously I won a Premier League medal. I didn't do a huge amount for the team to win that, but played enough games. But I was so mentally and physically exhausted from all the training. Because obviously when you're not in the team, you do all the yeah, training. Yeah, yeah. And it was it, like it was really an incredible experience to be in and around yeah. them players day in day out and of course the manager and his coaching staff as well so Joe, like obviously you've played at the yeah. top for a number of years as well one turtles it, I've, I've had a taste of it shortly obviously mm. but that that is the mainstay isn't it yeah. day in day out it is driven into you yeah you know to to, to work hard to compete yeah and that's why they, yeah. they you end up winning yeah, the stuff it. that you've won. That's it. See, like the way the way I see it, the difference and the difference is getting smaller and smaller with the top side. That Manchester United era with Ferguson and Keane driving the standards. Them players, you know, there wasn't much difference between them players and the Liverpool players. You know, there were some great players at Liverpool. Yeah. You know, Manaman, Ince, Redknapp, Fowler. Mm. But the difference at Manchester United was the manager and working driving it. 
It's interesting what Chaddy said about Roy telling him, you know, because not a lot of players get the courtesy of that. Uh, They've just got the volley. Yeah. And that's it. Sink or swim, you have to deal with it. So, but yeah, the top level, I admire any player. I mean, I, I, I had seven years at Chelsea, um, but like when I, but then the flip side, my body, my body gave in yeah. at, at 29, 30. You know, my mind still wanted to do it, my body gave in. But then players who can do it for so long at the top, yeah. like your JTs and Franks, who I played with Drogba's, body and mind, it is it's tough. Some, mm. You're right, after after the season, you're just like, bosh, you're just gone because yeah. the intensity. And I know that's what, as I come down the levels again, that was the main difference. So yeah. when I go into coaching and management, that is a non-negotiable for me. Whatever quality of players I've, I manage or what around us, yeah, the intensity has to be there yeah. all the time. But yeah, Manchester United, Roy Keane, that is that was the pinnacle. Just, just talk about Roy Keane. Is it true that he used to car share or he used to pick you up? You didn't drive when you was at United. He, he at picked me up a few times. I remember one famous time he, <laughs> he picked me up was uh, the Manchester derby at Old Trafford. <laughs> right. And I started the game and I was surprised to start with it. I got subbed off and in the end, like it was one all, like end of yeah. season. I think we'd already won the league and it was yeah. a bit scrapping. It was a day where... Kino's <laughs> chopped Harland in half. Oh, wow. Ooh. And I'm sort of in the dressing room after thinking... So you've gone to the game in the car. So I've gone with him. <laughs> right in the car with him. What was he like on that journey on the way in? Was he sort of just like, like focused he, on the like game? He was obviously. fine. Like he was like relaxed character. Like obviously there was a big game ahead yeah. of us and whatnot, but like just normal really. Yeah. But, and I'm thinking after the game, I'm just sat in the dressing room. Obviously Kino's been sent off and I'm thinking... How am I going to get home? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see him anywhere. No, and I'm like, the game must have finished about two hours. Like, everyone's gone. And I'm just like sat in Old Trafford in the home dressing room on my own, like being the cleaners and sweeping up and that. And then, like, all of a sudden, I don't know where he'd been. He's like, just probably just sending his come on, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> the guy in the car just took me back to me, me flat, like just in sale, not like just up the road. Yeah. Like the whole. Yeah. Car journey, I was just silent. I was <laughs> sat looking out the window. <laughs> <and I> was... <laughs> <laughs> he threw, like, dropped me off and he just said, if you go out tonight, be careful. <laughs> he said, I got out of the car and really? I'm just gone. No. So it was, it was um, <laughs> like, a surreal situation. Yeah. But yeah, I used to, I like, didn't pass my driving test till I was like yeah. 21 or something. Yeah. So yeah. Me, Mrs. usually just sort of dropped me off. Yeah. But on a game day, yeah. he'd pick me up occasionally and drop me off. And I was thinking, why have you got sent off, Keen? I just want to go on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was an iconic moment in, in football as well, an iconic... It's, it's one of them moments where you're just watching and it, yeah. whether you're on the bench, you know, it mm. just sort of takes your breath yeah. away, thinking... Mm. So oh, that, that journey home, nothing sort of said, it was just literally silent. I, I, can, I can imagine... No, yeah. I mean, I was going to say, Roy, what's all that about? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it in me, so I sat what, there. Is that what Fergie said, Arthur? What was said? Was nothing said after the game? Nothing was said. I mean, yeah. like, like I say, when I come in, the team come in, he just wasn't, wasn't there. there. I don't know where he'd gone wow. or what he was doing, but Brilliant. yeah, it was um, a strange one. Brilliant. Great story. Um, Great look, story. I mean, you played 39 times, as you said, for United and, you know, <coughs> got a Premier League winner's medal. Uh, some people don't even achieve that. Uh, how do you look back on your time at United? I loved it. Yeah. Like, like, like when I just, like I mentioned before, when I went up there as a 14 year old boy, mm. I just fell in love with a place. Yeah. It just felt so different to anything I'd ever experienced in terms of you felt it so wanted. Yeah. All the coaches were so enthusiastic. They were so pleased to see. And it just felt like everyone wanted to be there, yeah. which probably did because of yeah. the success they were having at the time. Obviously, I had a Loved the youth. I think that's the, mm. the best time of everyone's football yeah. career, in it? That two years at a YTS yeah. where you're just out of school, yeah. doing something you love every day. Went online to Antwerp, loved that, come back, and then sort of had a in and around it. So I'm never really comfortable being famous or being yeah. part yeah. of that squad in terms of probably went into it, not understand like, all I ever wanted to do was be a footballer, yeah. play football. I was never really or thought about the fast cars, uh, yeah, the incredible yeah, money yeah. that we're lucky enough to earn and that sort of thing. It was all, So sort of what came with it made me feel a bit uncomfortable when you're out yeah. and people yeah. know you yeah. are and that yeah, sort of yeah. thing. But always loved it on the pitch, playing for the team, playing with the people you watched on the telly growing up. Yeah. And it was sort of, the, after the first season made it, 
a bit of an impact being in and around it, then probably suffered with some injuries to my hips mm. and my groins. And the one sort of outstanding aspect that I had as a, as a young player growing up was I was incredibly fast, sort mm. of running with a ball yeah. without the ball. That both was my... You, you glided, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, both ways, yeah. And probably without that, I didn't have enough to play at the top, top level. That was my outstanding attribute. And probably after a couple of surgeries, lost a little bit of that mm. top level pace and sort of felt it myself. You know, when when I first went in there training, I could feel, obviously I wasn't the best player, but I could make an impact, I could yeah. beat players and lost a bit of that and sort of slipped further and further away from the team. And the manager pulled me in and sort of said, like, you're not what you once were in yeah. terms of you've had a couple of surgeries and you're not moving as freely and sort of said, you're not, you're not going to make it here. It's going to be tough for you to make it at the top level, which is obviously hard to hear, but at the yeah. same time, you can feel you it yourself yeah. and you appreciate that honesty. <clears throat> and then it was sort of time to move on. I never, I was not sad about leaving United. Yeah. All, all I ever wanted to do was be a professional footballer, whether that be at yeah. Man United, yeah. Cambridge United, MK, yeah. whoever it may be. So it, yeah. it excited me at the same time and sort of coming away from that environment of yeah. being at the biggest club in the world and maybe enjoying it a little bit more, but also having to reinvent the way I played to a certain extent when I come to to Reading and yeah. play with you yeah. and yeah. it was a really good team. But yeah. probably I was in that transition of not being that winger that, that I was with Howard out on yeah. the touchline yeah. and stand on the touchline and run with the ball to someone who's got to come inside and find little pockets. And it mm. probably took me a, a few years to to understand that of what I was doing now, but still loved it. Like yeah, I could yeah. not change anything no. in my career. It was um, an incredible. Do you think, Chaddy? Because I was interested you say that because I I felt the same. I, you wanted to be a footballer, and everything else that come with it was I was so uncomfortable with like the the pub the, the glare. You know, the, the money was nice. I I won't give that back. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the the you know the fame and and then you know you just wanted like do you think these the, the, new, the new players now are more equipped for that they understand what they're getting into a bit more a bit more like you said you just come from a village in Cambridge right bang yeah you're, how was that you're in, you're a Man United player hmm. yeah I mean it's it's hard to say I think where I struggled is I sort of attracted attention for the for nothing to do with football a lot of the time. Mm. The way that I looked, I had teeth that stuck out, spots on my face and that sort of thing, and probably struggled with that, where I suffered thinking that everyone's just talking about it. it was nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine if someone says I am had a bad game. I mean, that's probably happened yeah. about 400 times in my career. <laughs> like, but it was more that that I was uncomfortable yeah, about. Yeah. I think there is more education now. I think yeah. the game has changed a lot, but I think mm. there's still so much to be done mm. to support that where you go from out of a YTS team yeah. to earn him yeah. 30 grand. Or, like how, it's it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to, it, to commute. It, yeah, to understand that mm. and not for it to, to change who you are yeah. and what your, your values, your ideals are because it is such a, it's just it's an incredible yeah. industry yeah. but so far removed from real life yeah. to a certain extent. You, you yeah. certainly had love for the game. I remember when you signed for Reading and at that time we was in a transition period of going from uh, different training grounds. So we'd either train, change at the stadium and then mm. drive to the university and then the playing fields down there and then drive mm. back to the stadium and have mm. lunch and, and, and getting changed. And Chaddy was driving in from Cambridge at the time. So obviously I could imagine you leaving early in the morning to miss the traffic and you'd go straight to the training ground because you didn't, I think you used to take kit home. And I used to get there, obviously the carpools would all turn up and Chad would be the first one there every day because obviously mm. he, he was travelling from afar. But he'd have the football out, yeah. kicking a ball up against like, the, the, the bricked sort of yeah, yeah, um, yeah. pavilion there. So he must have had a ball in the boot, had his boots on straight away, on his own. No one was there and he was just kicking a ball up, up against the wall. Just you know. that, that was just because I didn't want to speak to you lads in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'd be looking up. So as soon as your car's pulled up, I'd start kicking a ball against the wall, <laughs> make it look like I'm doing something. No, I always, I still do. Yeah. I just love, yeah. Yeah. love playing football. You had, a, you had a couple of loan spells. One at Reading. We lost in the playoff semi-finals to Wolves. Uh, he went on to Burnley under the legendary Stan Turner. What was what was that like? Yeah, it was, it was um, like incredible. Because when I come to you to Reading, yeah, like I was the 
Sir Alex wanted me to go to to Cardiff because he was mates with Lenny right. Lawrence, yeah. but I was keen to go. I spoke to Pards yeah. and I was keen to come down there. And then, so I went into Carrington before I went down to Reading and the, to see the manager like early doors because I was driving around there. He went, he went, you're not going. He went, you're going to Cardiff. I said, Gaffer, I'll go to Reading. Yeah. And he went, do what you f-ing want then, but see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So my missus, my missus is like nine months pregnant. And we're driving down yeah. to meet to meet Pards at Red and I'm like the whole way down thinking, what does he mean? <laughs> what, what, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so I got down there, like met, met with Pards. He sort of said, Oh, you've had a message at the PA. Alex Ferguson wants you to phone him. So Pards phoned, I'm sat in the office with my missus. Pards phones the um the gaffer, and I'm like just sat there, like my face is just fallen white, thinking, what's he gonna say? And yeah. I can hear, like, and the Pardis face has just dropped, and I can hear, I can't hear what he's saying, yeah. but a man at Fergie is like shouting at Pardis down the phone. The hair treatment down the phone. So, like, Pardis put the phone down and said, he said, well, he said, you can, you can come, but they ain't gonna pay you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. So, I'm like on a decent contract yeah. at night, and Pard said, oh, we can pay you yeah. this, which is about half the money. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So in the end, I've just signed there for half the money because I was wow. myself to go back up <laughs> see what Fergie would say when I got back up there. <laughs> that took a massive hit, but it was worth it to not get a bollocking when I went back up <laughs> But yeah, I loved it. Ready. Then, went to, then I went back to United yeah. and, um, like, obviously... Sir Alex had pre, like, obviously realised how much I love football. I'd like, given up half yeah. my money and that sort of thing and sort of was absolutely fine with me. And then he goes, um, Burnley will take you next yeah. season. And I said, oh, that's fine, yeah. He went, stands with mate as well. <laughs> well, so you can, we'll pay you all your money. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, Burnley was uh, obviously... Glenn Little, who was at Red yeah, and, like, yeah, he's Blakey, a yeah. funny lad. It was a great dress room, Robbie Blake. It was... Um, like, fan, like Stan, Sam Ellis, brilliant yeah. football people, maybe done things a little bit <laughs> old school like, but it was, um, I loved, I loved my time at Burnley. It was proper, proper old school and so sort of far removed from, from Man from United. Man United yeah. like, I loved Man United, but I quite enjoyed yeah. that other side of it as well, where yeah. it was a bit we, more relaxed. Just reminded me, but this old school Burnley, I ordered, I asked, was it Burnley doing a game for BT? And I love Burnley. It's, it's like going back in time and you go in there. And I asked for a green tea off of the lady. She looked at me like I swore at her. <laughs> we don't do green tea up here, love. I went, what? And she, just, she just put a proper tea in front of me. I thought, oh, she went. And she, you can see her thinking, you cockneys come up here with your green tea. <laughs> yeah, bovril, isn't it? It's a, bit, it's a cup of bovril. <laughs> but I do love Burnley. I do like a good They look after us up there. So you had, you had your own spells. You're, you're kind of falling back in love with the game and getting into a comfortable environment. 2004, you signed for West Ham. Pards signed you for West Ham. Yeah, yeah buzzing, buzzing to go to West Ham. Obviously knew Pards from, from Reading. Yeah. Great guy. Went down there. Like, what a club. Yeah. West Ham. Yeah. He absolutely loved it there. Obviously to... To have that, you know it better than me, but playing yeah. under the lights at Upton yeah, Park, yeah, yeah. it's an incredible place yeah. to play. Yeah. It was a tough season, to be fair. Like, Pards was under massive pressure. We only sneaked in the playoffs mm. at the end of the day, but then went up, beat Preston in the final. That's Bobby it. scored the That's winner, right. and yeah. it was, like, great times. And that was the worst thing that happened for me, though, was getting promoted to the Premier League, because in that summer, I'm thinking, back in the Prem, West Ham. Yeah, and then yeah. they went and signed Yossi Benayin, and I was surplus yeah. to requirements. Yeah. So I was on the on the, but he was an absolute yeah. player, yeah. and obviously got to respect that. And then I was off to to Stoke. Stoke. Yeah, yeah. Did Paul tell? Did he? Did he have the conversation with you, like one to one, to say, "Listen, you're not going to be in my plans," or no, in case not really you find another that. club for yourself? <laughs> he gave me a new contract. I remember at the end of the season. When we got promoted, don't get me wrong, he'd have a few beers, but he yeah. assured me I was a massive part of his plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time I spoke to him. <laughs> but that, then, yeah, but the, obviously that's that's the game. Yeah, and went mm-hmm. off to um, to Stoke. Yeah, and like had a good like I, I can't complain. All the teams I went up, obviously there was challenges at yeah. all of them, but they were all great you clubs, and I had yeah. some real good moments yeah. at all of them. I suppose it, in similarities, going to Stoke wasn't as big a culture shock if you hadn't probably experienced the Burnley scenario because they're, they're quite 
sort of similar environments. I'd yeah, say. I mean, it was. It's more the people. Like when I went to Stoke, the manager was um, Johan Boskamp, who knew me from my time in Belgium. Yeah, like, and it yeah. was um, again, it was a, a different environment, completely different to parts right. of West Ham, yeah. Stanhope, Burnley. It was. Um, it was like again. It was. It all went a bit. Tits up, really. Though, because <laughs> he was a loose cannon, the manager, and he ended up. <laughs> why? Why was he a loose cannon? He was a, like he was a massive character. Yeah. But then he fell out with his um, assistant manager. But they were both under contract, so the, the <laughs> so John Rudge was. Do you remember Rudge? But Rudge couldn't bring himself to sack either of them, so they were both like the manager and the assistant, but they didn't speak to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you did like one would take part of the session, the other would take a part, but there'd be no joined up thinking. And the, la the lads could sense that. Yeah, the lads. Oh, you, it was you open. Like they, yeah. they, they wouldn't even look at each other or speak to each other. <laughs> Rudge is at the side of the pitch just shaking his head not knowing what to do. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, th that in, in itself is a calamity. You end up going to Milton Keynes where you probably spend the, the most time in your career. Is that the, the, the club where you was, like you found comfort and peace because it sounds like it's just been a roller coaster of a ride already. <laughs> so I went from, I really enjoyed Stoke, but was sort of travelling, family living up yeah. after, and it weren't working, moved the family up, didn't really settle. I was more comfortable with them back in Cambridge, so wanted to get back there. So got to move to, to Norwich, which I was absolutely yeah. buzzing about. Peter Grant was the manager, knew him really well from his time assisting pards at West Ham. Like, absolutely buzzing, moved home. First game we played, Ipswich in a derby, made my debut at Portman Road, scored. Yeah. Fans all singing my name, thinking, here we go. Yeah. This is what it's all about. <laughs> then at the end of the game, like 10 minutes to go, some gear, uh, Matthew Bates used to be at Middlesbrough. I'm sort of shielding the ball out, not the strongest lad in the world, yeah. like, but he's sort of come up, barged me. I've gone off the pitch and I'm just like a heap on the floor and I'm thinking, oh, you know, when you're winded and you're trying yeah. to catch your breath, I got my breath back, my shoulders popped out as well. Ooh, but that painful. used to happen quite a lot, but I got it back in and Adam Jury, the left-back's come up behind me and said, don't look down. So immediately I looked down and my knees just completely opened up and there was sort oh. of the bones sticking out and I'm oh. thinking, I'm struggling here. <laughs> and sort of come off the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm in there, we've got our, the dock at Norwich and he's about, I don't know, 65, 70 years old, and I, the hole in my knees like this, and he's trying to stitch it up, and he's thinking, he's not making it any How better. How did you do it? Like, was it a... So it, it's the, um, you know them furry microphones? Oh, no. I've gone into there, and I've sort of gone to, I'm in hospital for two days, they've only signed me on loan, but uh, Grant is phoning me and said, like, we're still, because the, the deal was to, to sign me for two years yeah. after the loan, I've yeah. stayed there, but it, it was like the dream move yeah. It just turned into an absolute nightmare. Never really got myself fit. Was out for about nine months with a knee, the swelling. They just couldn't get the swelling down. And then that's when I sort of said to my agent, what about MK Dons? Yeah. Because I just wanted to be yeah. local now. I wanted yeah. to live at home. And and it, play. It, it worked out a treat. Like, it's a like, fantastic club. Great stadium, ain't it? Yeah. Stadium's brilliant. Always play football the right way, didn't they? Yeah. And it was um, <coughs> like really enjoyed my time there. Great set of lads throughout my time. Fans were always great. Yeah. Some great managers I played under. The chairman was a great guy, like I say. And it was a real settled time where I was just living at home, travelling in, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Happiest time of your career? Yeah, it must be. You got voted player of the year twice, two yeah. years on the spin. So you must have felt sort of, as I say, the time where you're playing as freely as you've ever played in yeah. your career. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's hard to say the happiest. Like, I, yeah. But there's times... At every club, I'm yeah. sure you're saying, where yeah. times have been massively challenging yeah. and times where you've absolutely loved it. Yeah. Like, uh, Milton Keynes was certainly the most settled time in my life yeah. off the pitch as well, where I'm living at home, yeah. everything's there, I'm yeah. travelling and training, and it was, it, it worked really well and like a real, mm. a real good time there. The irony of, of, of the, uh, the whole football journey, you, you end up back at Cambridge and then your last professional start 
was for Cambridge against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Madness. That's mad. Incredible. And you get a standing ovation as well. Yeah, from, I from could, everyone. In, in that's amazing. The that's, that's crazy. Oh, yeah, it's un unbelievable. Don't get me wrong, I didn't want that to be my last game. It's yeah. just how it sort yeah. of ended up. But it was... Um, I was like, it was a cup game. Was it an FA Cup or was it a League Cup game? FA I, Cup. FA Cup. When was it? What, what 2000 16th? Yeah, it would have yeah, been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember. Yeah. yeah, so we played them at the Abbey. Yeah. Drew nil-nil. I think it was when Van Gaal was in charge. Sort of went back up to, yes. excuse me, Old Trafford and got beat. I remember sort of, we're on the bus on the way to the game and I'm, like, in my head I'm thinking, I can just see myself absolutely bossing it tonight. <laughs> playing, <laughs> playing for Cambridge. And I was playing on the left wing and I'm up against, we've done the teams playing Paddy McNair's yeah, right yeah. back. And he was sort of having a bit of a like, fantastic play, but I, mean, I think, I just think I'm going to tear him up and just have yeah, a go yeah. in my life. Get there, 20 minutes in, I'm absolutely blowing out my ass. And all I'm doing <laughs> is chasing him back on overlaps. I've done nothing. And then, like, about five minutes into the second half, the gaffer's put me out of my misery, gets subbed off. But, like, I, like going up there, generally, it's the first time I've ever been back there. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm aware that. I'm not a massive part of Man United's yeah. future, but uh, it just shows what the club is. To even I didn't think I'd even be remembered really, yeah. like the odd player. But to get that stand, yeah. like makes uh, made the hairs on the back of my neck mm. stand up to, yeah. to receive that. And it was yeah. a special, special moment, and for that to end up being my last start in yeah. professional football was um, like incredible, incredible yeah. story. When I went there when I was 12 years old, and um, playing in the centre of excellence, and they let me go. And I'll never forget them letting me go because I had to go straight from Cambridge training to Cubs in the right. local village. I mean, mum took me back to Cubs and I remember getting there and I was like crying my eyes out. But the, the Arcala took me to the side, had a couple of words with me and it was there. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was good again. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I'm like really emotional like in terms of the journey and stuff. And, and you're right, the Man United fans are, they, they are one of a kind. I've, I've sat in the Stratford Inn a couple of times um, and they don't stop singing at home. And I've been actually in a way, I'm not even a Man yeah. United supporter. I've actually been in the away fans as well. And I think away from home, they're even, they're just as good. Yeah. Just as good. Yeah, um, definitely. I think the away fans, like when I played there, the away yeah. fans were, they're so yeah. passionate. Obviously Old Trafford is different sometimes because you get a lot of tourists, a lot of different people there. Mm. But the away fans at United were always incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's move on to what really happened. We're going to go back to a moment in your career and we want to find out more about it. So you touched on it earlier on. Um, we want to know more about the brave decision um, when you decided to speak out about the abuse that you suffered, you know, when you was playing and the stick that you was getting, really, because, I mean, at the time, like you say, it was... it was. I mean, nowadays, it's, it's, it's not really done, is it? Mm. It's, it's more done on social media. Whereas back then, it was sort of okay to do it on TV and there was a few shows, wasn't there? And, and, and it affected your confidence. Yeah, I think it it didn't affect me on the pitch. No. It was off the pitch where it had a massive sort of negative effect on my life where I was obsessed by it, where I wouldn't want to go out because I think this was all... And in reality, that's my responsibility, my fault. I don't blame anyone else for that, but it's sort of one of them things where when I said about it and I never thought it'd get the the attention that it did receive. It wasn't, I think the message got lost slightly in terms of what I was saying. It was obviously the start of COVID. Mm. I was just put a tweet out saying that handling it the way I handled it isn't the best way of doing it. Yeah. You better talk it when you've got issues. Obviously, if you talk about it, it's a massive yeah. weight yeah. off shoulder, which I felt at the time I couldn't mm. do. And the, it sort of changed into a blame game of what happened in terms of the TV show and that sort of thing, when it was never really about that. No. It was a, looking to be a positive message to, and don't get me wrong, I know I'm not a big, massive star that millions of people are going to speak to, but if it can just help one person, if them words help one mm. person, that was sort of what, what, it, what it was about. So it wasn't, it's something obviously I've dealt with, I'm over now as part of my journey in life really, but it was just trying to talk about promoting positive mental health yeah, and yeah. talking about your problems when you're struggling. Did you have anyone to, to to speak to or did you have people that would try and sort of get it out of you or, I mean, back back when you was playing and then you sort of kind of brushed it off or was there just nothing, was it just left to your own devices? No, I just weren't interested in 
entertaining talking about it. I mean, I wouldn't even say I was struggling to my to my girlfriend, to yeah. my mum, my dad, my brother, yeah. my family, my friends, because I was so embarrassed by it because it was such a a schoolboy sort of thing where someone says something in the playground, but it was on such a a mass scale in terms of on the yeah. telly every week. Yeah. And I used to like dread it. But at the same time, if someone said something to me, I'd just laugh it off so I, it don't bother me when in reality it was really affecting yeah. the way that yeah. I was off the pitch. Yeah, and this this was on a show, wasn't it? They think it's all over. Was yeah, yeah, that was one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean... It, I mean, what made you? I mean, I'll say what made you come out and break the silence. But as you say, if it, it, you, you've done an interview and it's sort of all sort of gone down different avenues, whereas you're just trying to make it a positive. Yeah, so note, it was because everyone was everyone. Well, I say everyone. There was a lot of people struggling when COVID happened. That that was sort of where it came from. Yeah. I mean, I've like started on social media with the new business that I was working, trying to build, and everything that I put on there was just. A terrible, terrible banter, really. There was no mm -hmm. nothing behind it. So it was just trying to be something with a bit of meaning. Like I said, I never thought it'd get the attention that it'd get. Yeah. And then the attention that it did get probably wasn't around what I was trying to yeah. promote, yeah. more about yeah. what happened in the past. So yeah. it was, um, like I say, it's, I'm more than comfortable yeah. speaking about it. I mean, yeah. it was 20 odd years ago or whenever, but I think it's so important that as much as possible, people don't deal with it how I did, where you become mm. a master of burying your feelings yeah. and not wanting to talk about them rather than yeah. being able to express yourself and showing that vulnerability <clears throat> that I could never show as mm. a young man because I weren't emotionally intelligent enough to do it. And I think that's where football sort of encapsulates you and your yeah. whole life, mm. where everything in my life was all about football. Yeah. So when I went through these struggles... I had no idea how to deal with them because it was all, if I was doing all right at football, then everything's at fine. Yeah. But this made me yeah. understand that maybe yeah. that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. no, totally agree. It's, I mean, sorry, Sid. No. Um, when, when, did, when did you first start thinking, oh, I need to deal with it a different way? Was there someone else? Was it like your missus or I think it was just dad? sort of the journey. Yeah. I think like I mentioned before, when I went to, to Reading then, but like coming away from Man United and sort of, not, I was never a confident yeah. Per, like a confident football player, but not a confident person. Yeah. Sort of understand growing into myself a little bit, having a bit more confidence, being able yeah. to sort of express how I'm feeling more. And it was more like a, evolving as a person rather yeah. than one sort of moment where you think, I've got to get this off my chest now. Yeah. It was more of a, a long term process. Yeah. Because yeah. the way, sorry, the way, the way, the way you played is, was very confident. But like you was very. Uh, well, you're saying there, you're shy, but well, even there, when he's saying about going to Man United again, I'm yeah. gonna rip it up today. You know? Yeah, yeah, like, you'd like there's different polar opposites there. yeah. from like you was quite a lad, but on the pitch you was a flair player. Mm. You know, yeah, you know, and I think that's where I'd express myself would be yeah. playing football because that's what what I love doing. Yeah. I was like not a confident young man, mm. but a confident football player. So it's um, mm. God knows. <laughs> Fair play, Fair like, play listen, to you. Mental health, uh, you know, there's a lot going around, um, and it's been going around for ages. So anyone, anyone that is struggling, make mm. sure you share your problems and speak and get it off your chest. Yes, definitely. Problem shared is pro definitely a problem um, half. Uh, right, look, let's talk Premier League. So your old team, Bernie, take on my old team, Villa, on Saturday. Bernie, Mike Jackson, I mean, mm. what a job he's got in and done there. He's, done, um, he's been incredible. I mean, when the turnaround happened with Sean Dyche getting the sack or mm. parting. People are thinking that's them done, but wow, yeah. what a turnaround. I mean, it, uh, again, you've got to give Mike Jackson a lot of credit, but I think you've got to give the group of players a lot of credit as yeah. well because of the, when what Daishi's done for years and years, he's just made this sort of like, this, this machine, this way of playing. They've always got something to fall back on. Yeah. I always felt with Burnley like I always I never thought they were done when Daishi left. I thought, well, no. that's not gonna help them. Yeah. But I looked at the group of players, McNeil, Cornet's a good player, uh, Cork and Westwood in midfield yeah. and, and Brownhill. So they had players. But they've actually done such a good job at organising them. They've got something to fall back on. And then they've gone on a run and you give Mike Jackson credit. But um, it, it, it's the pl the players, the group yeah. of players. They're, they're certainly good enough to, to stay up. They've just got a bit of confidence yeah. back in them, haven't they? Do you, mm. see, do you see them getting out of here? Look, Norwich down. Watford are near enough down, aren't they're they? They're down. I mean, it's one of Leeds, Burnley or <clears> Everton, you know? Do you, who, who, do you, who do you see the, 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 the third one? Yeah, I just don't see Everton going. They seem to have mm. been there 
so long. Mm. But having said that, like Burnley have picked up. Like, yeah. they, Everton didn't beat Chelsea on the weekend. They were yeah. scrambling, weren't yeah. they? You're thinking they're gone now, but he's, yeah. they've got another result. I think Burnley on a great run of form. Yeah. That like, game against Villa is huge. That they yeah. have to win that game, really, don't they? And yeah. you yeah. think if they do, and you look at Everton, you're thinking, are Leeds getting... Stuck back That's into what a lot of people now. are forgetting Leeds. Yeah. yeah, Leeds. Yeah, Leeds have just one of. There's always someone that gets drawn back into yeah. and Leeds are that team, and their running is horrendous. Their four games, I look at them and I'm like, Oof. the next. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but the next two games, I think is is it Liverpool? No, who's, who they got? it's going to go to the wire. Whatever yeah. happens, it's going to go down yeah. to it. But Leeds, yeah, you're right. Leeds got Leeds, tough running. I looked at the other day and I thought Leeds. I I, I looked at. I tried to tally up the points. Thought, well, Leeds got Arsenal. Yeah, That's what it is. you know, um, Arsenal going for Europe. So. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I fancy, if you're going to ask me now, I fancy Leeds go, you know. Leeds to go? Yeah. I reckon Burnley. Burnley, yeah. Yeah. Just not enough. I just don't think they'll have quite enough. And I think Everton, just with the history, the fans, mm. I just think they'll just sneak yeah, up. If they go, it's huge. It's do, do, know, do you know what was great? Looking at the connection between the fans and Frank, they've really taken to Frank. Yeah. I think they, they, they're they educated fans, the Everton fans. <clears> I think they, they understand the job Frank's come into is a lot tougher than we... There was a lot of... You know, it was one of them, a lot of papers over cracks. There's a lot of things wrong at Everton. Yeah. So that, and the fans got behind Frank and they scored some two last-minute goals, haven't they, in the last few weeks at Goodison. Well, the atmosphere at Goodison was so, electric, wasn't it, the other yeah. day? Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to go to the wire. What about the, the other end then? Top four, Spurs face Liverpool, Anfield, late kick-off on Saturday. Arsenal are in the driving seat at the moment. Mm. Yeah, for, is this going to go down to that North London derby? Oh, it's going to be great, and it's, it's what a game that'll yeah. be. Um, Spurs, you know, Spurs have picked up. It's going to be tough for Liverpool, you know, uh, coming off that because uh, the the game last night they was outstanding, incredible team. Could had the opportunity to go down as one of the great teams of all time. Mm. They go and pull off the quadruple. Yeah, that you could you couldn't argue with that. Outstanding, but with Tottenham. I, I feel that they've got Conte's got the manager who can go up there and get something. Yeah, so it's a huge game for both Liverpool and Spurs. Yeah. More so for no, no, it's a it's a huge game for both. But I and I think Tottenham could could do something up at Anfield at the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. every chance. Arsenal host Leeds on Sunday, so you've got Spurs facing Liverpool Saturday. Mm. Arsenal at Leeds on Sunday. Top four, it's in the balance, isn't mm. it? I mean, is that a, literally a toss of a coin, Spurs or Arsenal? Yeah, I, I can see Spurs going to Liverpool and winning purely because the way Liverpool play yeah. and the way Spurs mm. play with that height. And you saw Spurs do it at City yeah. like when they got went up there and got a result. In Arsenal, you never know. Mm. They're, like they've had a decent season, but yeah. you look at Leeds at home and you're thinking they could slip yeah. up. It. I think that that is going to go. And obviously, the big game is the the North London derby, yeah. isn't it? Mm. and that's going to be have a massive say. <clears> and who does get the that full yeah. place. Okay, Coral, I'll give you some Coral odds. If you think Burnley will beat Villa 2-1, Coral will give you odds of 10 to 1. It's 20 to 1 for Salah to score a hat trick against Spurs. He's in fine form. Yeah. Um, he's set a target of 40 goals this season. Mm. Um, and if you think Leeds will nick a 1 0 win at the Emirates with Rafinha being the goal scorer, Coral will give you odds of 90 to 1. Oh, that's that's good. If that's Rafinha's good. a player. Yeah. That's a great shout out. I like that. Let's repeat that one. Leeds to nick a 1 0 win at the Emirates. Uh, Rafinha to score. Coral will give you odds of 90 to 1. Um, right, time for the Super Series. Man City versus Newcastle is the pick mm. now for the Coral Super Series. Coley, you're losing for the first time in this series 15 uh, 14. All right, so our guest. So, <laughs> what, uh, what did I get wrong? I, I, I thought I did all right at the weekend. No, 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 struggling. No. Right, trying to nick it and trying to complain. <laughs> you was uh, you got the cards wrong. Oh, yeah, God. I remember watching it. Yeah. I remember seeing it come up. Uh, right, we're going to ask you both four simple questions. Um, it's Man City versus Newcastle, okay? And it's uh, it's on Sunday. So, mm -hmm. who will win the game? Got to go, Man City. Man City. Yeah, City. City. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Who will score the first goal? Take your pick out of them. Isn't it? It's, this is a lottery. Isn't it? I'm going to go. Is Jesus fit? Uh, yeah. I'm going to go Jesus. I don't know why. I've got the, the, the little fella. I think he's going to come into a bit of form. All right. I'm going to go Grealish. I think yeah. he might start. Ooh. I don't think yeah, he'll play tonight. I think shout. he might play. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good shout, that. Clever. How many corners? <laughs> but Man City can end up just keeping the ball. Uh, I'm going to go eight. Yep. Is that the whole game? Yep. How many corners? 
<laughs> no, it's not four corners on the pitch, it's how many corners. <laughs> <laughs> I can't oh, believe no one's used that yet. No, no, yeah. I'll go five. Five. Uh, how many players will be carded? Two. Won't it be quite any. It's quite, a, you yeah. know, Newcastle got nothing to play for. No need to them to be flying to tackles. Three. Okay, all right. It's really tight. 15 14. Uh, people at home, as ever, if you want to get involved, you can do. Just head over to coral.co.uk. Answer the questions correctly to win cash prizes, but please gamble responsibly. Um, Right, if you're looking for something to watch tomorrow night on TV, ITV4 have got you covered. Uh, Coral's latest episode of Against the Odds features the flat racing jockey Johnny Murtagh. You can watch Johnny Murtagh creating belief in the, the Against All Odds uh, series, which airs at 9pm on Thursday on ITV4, or you can watch it on the ITV Hub straight after it airs. Um, Chaddy. That's what we've got time for, mate. Pleasure, it's mate. been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure. What are you up to now at the moment? Are you, uh, what, what, what are, you, are you coaching or...? I direct for a company called the Football Fun Factory, which is an organisation around making football fun for children, using football as a vehicle to develop positive life skills just as much as football skills. So a really rewarding Brilliant. role mm. I'm in at the moment. Brilliant. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, right. it's been absolutely a joy to have you on. Um, yeah. It's been a great laugh. By the way, no one better to be doing that, you know, somebody who loves the game. So, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. No, fair play. Uh, just a quick mention on the uh, the podcast awards last week. We actually didn't win the award uh, that we was up for. It was down to American... Say, Met American, Met American Met say Aries, though, we, we think there was a bit of skullduggery going on. No, we? there definitely was there something was. going on. And, but, uh, and Jess wasn't happy with the 54 bottles of Fifty-four pound bottles of warm prosecco that we had to pay at the awards ceremony. <laughs> Joe said he will reimburse you for that, Jess. Uh, but listen, we will be winning awards next year. We will come back stronger. So uh, look, you can find us on the Joe YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast from. You have been listening to All to Play For, brought to you by Joe and Coral. We'll see you next time. You've been watching All to Play For, brought to you by Joe and Coral.